Wow. Okay, so now is yours. Thank you so much, Heiko, and um, uh, hi to everyone. Very happy to uh, be here virtually um, to talk about one of my favorite um, approaches to thinking about brain and behavior. Um, so we'll dive right in. And um, if there are some points of clarification, um, try to get my attention and I can stop and pause. I try, I try not to pack too many slides in, so hopefully we, this won't take uh, too long, but it's very easy to digress and um, get into each of each slide itself could be a book if you if you um, want to dive in. But uh, and with that, let's let's do that. So my plan for today is to uh, give, give an overview of what dynamical systems theory is. It's not unique to neuroscience. So and there's some terminology that we need to uh, to learn, which can be a little bit daunting. Um, so but I think that it's a very intuitive um, field. So uh, I want to provide some mainly some motivation so that you can then dive in on your own if you're interested. And also when you see terminology, you'll know more or less what it means. So uh, dynamical systems theory, DST, uh, prevents uh, a distinctive set of mathematical methods and conceptual tools. Um, and you can use this for what we might call traditional data fitting, uh, you know, in neural data like spiking or fMRI data, but um, arguably the qualitative insights um, are more valuable. And I'll try to focus on that sort of thing today. Um, you'll find that uh, there's uh, what I it seems to be a growing interest in uh, modeling uh, neural data with dynamical systems, but this field has been around for a while. Um, the earliest inklings of this um, were uh, work in physics by uh, the mathematician Henri uh, Poincaré. Uh, and uh, throughout the 20th century, there were um, some very interesting developments. And it's used across pretty much every scientific um, field that's interested in dynamics, how things change in time. Um, so it may be useful to think of not just neural data, but also high level cognitive, emotional and behavioral phenomena in terms of dynamical systems theory. So this is more speculative and I haven't ac actually put, like done any modeling specifically that does this and frames it in terms of dynamical systems theory, but I've nodded to, to this in a few places. So um, this is something that I think uh, is happening and, and it happens often in conversations with neuroscientists and psychologists, but uh, you don't often see, for instance, a book that tells you how to think about high-level phenomena in dynamical systems terms. So it's speculative, but I think uh, a useful lens. Um, it's worth noting, noting that this is a very vast field. Um, even just getting to the level of the basics can take a while. So, so my job uh, for the first two-thirds of this uh, is to give a bird's-eye perspective so you get a feel for it so that you can pick the, the parts that you're interested in um, and also when you come across it, feel more comfortable. Um, so I'll get to some basic ideas, some terminology uh, and how the math is used. And then we'll move and I'll try and you know notify you when we're using the same concepts in a more fuzzy or metaphorical way that might not have the exact same rigor um, as what you can do in one, two and three dimensions. Um, and th that's how we'll talk about psychiatric disorders, specific symptoms of psychiatric disorders. And um, if you're curious, as, as, as Heiko just mentioned, I, I went through um, dynamical systems theory for neuroscience in a sort of discussion group. In fact, that preceded the, the Grossberg discussion group. Um, and uh, so we I went through a, a couple of books and a few papers and tied in a few things. Um, so that gets into some, some of the detail of the calculus and, and some tutorials uh, also. Um, and uh, a, a group all around the world has participated. And as it turns out, uh, these discussions uh, kind of uh, led to a review paper um, that came out um, earlier this year um, called It's About Time, Linking Dynamical Systems uh, with Human Neuroimaging to Understand the Brain. And um, James M. Shine, Mac Shine, uh, was, um, and his co colleagues have really uh, been taking the um, dynamical systems approach to uh, the world of fMRI. So Michael, since I don't really do fMRI, my fMRI research, I was helped, you know, contributing with some of the high level conceptual um, aspects of, of this paper, which is um, an overview. Uh, it starts with some motivation, which is similar to what I'll talk about today. 
But a key idea here, we say that it's a crucial mechanistic framework for characterizing both the brain's time varying quality and its partial stability in the face of per perturbations. So as I see it, um, stability and uh, responses to perturbations, which relate to flexibility, that's the key idea here, which you may notice a lot of uh, models, computational uh, ideas and theories don't talk about this at all. Um, um, and if you think from a sort of ecological perspective, it, it makes sense that you need stability in addition to performance per se. Because if you have something that's very accurate and one tap on the head, you know, moves too many vesicles and then everything goes wrong, that's a problem. So stability is something to keep in mind. Um, and yes, yeah, so we'll dive into some of the ideas in this review paper. Could we start with what is a dynamical system? Um, it's a sort of vague term in a way. In physics, uh, it uh, we mention we talk about a dynamical system in terms of particles or groups of particles um, whose states vary over time, and you can talk about them in terms of derivatives and the calculus of change. And in mathematics, you have a slightly more broad sense um, of the time dependence of a point in some geometrical space, and this geometrical perspective is what gives it a kind of intuitive appeal. Um, so you can do talk about a change of a single quantity or a pair of quantities or in three dimensions. And these are the things you can visualize. But you can still actually use the geometric perspective even when you go to higher dimensions. But it's good to start in these in one, two, uh, one and two dimensions mainly. So I'll focus on a couple of very simple models um, from outside uh, neuroscience initially, just to ground some of the, the terminology. Um, but Another thing worth pointing out is that a system can be a dynamical system, but we may not always be looking at it from the perspective of dynamical systems theory. So it's a distinction some people don't make, but I think is worth making. Um, the theory is a body of tools for thinking about these time varying phenomena um, with a blend of calculus and geometry and with often with a visual perspective. So you may have a set of differential equations for describing a system, but you don't necessarily look at it from the um, this geometric perspective, this visual perspective. A lot of um, artificial neural network uh, research is not uh, typically thought of in terms of the concepts that we'll talk about today, for instance. So there's a theoretical lens in addition to the, the basic mathematical infrastructure. Um, so the central idea in dynamical systems theory is that a system's dynamics can be understood as a trajectory or a flow and so the system, uh, however complicated the system is, it's all boiled down to a point or a location in an abstract state space. And we'll get into what this abstract state space means. But the entire system, however many moving parts it has, it's all um, sort of encoded in a point in a space. So I've, I touched on this the last time I spoke, but I thought it was worth touching on again. There are a variety of different modeling approaches, so it's good to keep in mind what one is doing. There are statistical models, which are dominant in many uh, fields, including biology and neuroscience. And they, they, they summarize the data, but don't necessarily posit a causal interaction. And then you have dynamical models that um, actually sort of stick their necks out, necks out and, and say that this is how we uh, think um, some causal interaction may happen. Um, so this is a Galton board showing how you can get a normal distribution. But um, the key idea is that the data that you're looking at are assumed to involve random variables that are sampled from some dis distribution. And on the other hand, you could think of, um, I think this is called an, um, an or, uh, I forget what this is called, but it's a, it's a model of a solar system. And uh, the mathematical version of this that you can do in, in, in code is with differential equations. And you, you don't necessarily need to assume any randomness. You can add it later if you need to. Both of these uh, types of models can be used to fit data, but how you think about them um, will differ. Um, another uh, lens uh, to keep in mind when you talk about modeling of any sort is the forward versus reverse distinction. This paper by Jeremy Gunavardhana makes this point quite clearly in biology in general. Um, there are two kinds of modeling strategy, um, forward and reverse. So with reverse modeling, we start with the data, 
uh, and then we seek potential causalities suggested by the correlations in the data. And a lot of modeling is of this type. Um, forward modeling, um, which you see often in physics, um, starts from the known or suspected causalities, some sort of initial assumption from which you can make predictions. Obviously, these are you know often linked in a kind of feedback loop. So for instance, in astronomy, you have some data that come from observing the stars and the planets, which you can then turn into a model, such as the uh, famous Ptolemaic model um, with the Earth at the center. Um, or uh, what came later is you have so Newton, Newton's law of gravitation, and which was initially uh, posited for a variety of reasons, but then you could use that to make a prediction such as the existence of um, Neptune, I believe which was um, discovered with the point of a pen. Uh, so there was an anomaly in, in one of the um, movements. And just from first principles, it was worked out that there must be another planet out there. So that's a kind of way of thinking about forward and reverse modeling. And dynamical systems theory is very much in the, the forward direction. But beyond that, there are goals that are not just um, accounting for data. So in addition to types of models, there are different things you want out of a model. So we often find some, that uh, a variety of different systems in, across different fields even can be qualitatively similar. So we may want a kind of understanding that's invariant to some of the specific low level details because commonalities are um, worthy of expl explanation. Um, so dynamical systems theory can give us these qualitative insights into broad classes of systems. And um, as systems get more complex, as the dimensions increase, the quantitative fitting, which is always possible, you, um, you, know, you can throw um, a very complicated statistical model. Nowadays, you can use uh, an artificial neural network and you can get pretty good fits, but that doesn't necessarily tell you anything uh, about the system from the perspective of someone who'd like to control it or manipulate it or emulate parts of it. So with the DST, we get, um, we sacrifice some of the numerical accuracy sometimes, uh, and we simplify the system to get a kind of hands-on tractable understanding. So what are the concepts that uh, are worth, um, they're, they're the basic concept, but you need to kind of get them to use DST. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about attractors, repellers, perturbations and stability, something called limit cycles, bifurcations. These are all terms you often come across. And we'll try towards the end to um, link these to the brain and behavior. So stable neural or behavioral states may be attractor-like. And I say attractor-like because nothing in biology is truly stable. Uh, in one sense, the only truly stable thing is death. Um, um, so qualitative changes of various sorts uh, may be bifurcation-like. We'll see what that means. And um, some symptoms of psychiatric disorders may be bifurcation-like changes in stability. So this is what we're looking forward to, uh, trying to get a handle on the, the, this set of concepts. And for low-level uh, um, dynamical systems theory in neuroscience, mainly to do with a single neuron, I highly recommend uh, um, Ishikevich's book, um, even just the first few chapters are a really, really excellent um, introduction, and you'll get a very solid understanding of spiking neurons from this book. Um, another excellent book, which is not a neuroscience book, is Steve Strogatz's Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos. It was in my, my syllabus when I was a physics master's student. It's an excellent, very accessible book for undergraduates, master's students, and onwards. And in, in this book, he lays out um, the, the world uh, according to dynamical systems, where you can talk about the number of dimensions, the number of variables in the system, and also how nonlinear the interactions are. And you'll see that um, some, some things of interest to us, like biological oscillators um, show up here, um, and then you see neural networks. And so what that means is that the um, neuro, much of the neuroscience um, uh, topics that can be studied with dynamical systems are on the frontiers of dynamical systems theory. So as soon as you get to you know, uh, a medium-sized network or even just a few like tens of neurons, 
there are very few closed form solutions. So a lot of simulation is required and uh, there's not necessarily a definitive solution. So it's a frontier, which is also exciting. There are uh, new things to be discovered within the math, not just in the biology. Um, so let's start with examples, because uh, sometimes you, you uh, in, in Strogatz's book, for instance, you start with the mathematics, which I think physics students and math, math students often appreciate this, but people from other fields sometimes struggle if there's no example to ground the mathematics. So let's start with a classic one-dimensional system, population growth. Um, this notorious essay on the principle of population was written um, by uh, Thomas Malthus. Uh, it was a very influential essay. It had, interestingly, it's, uh, it was influential on both Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. <laughs> um, so the Mal Malthusian catastrophe occurs when, because of exponential growth in population, eventually uh, a population of humans is unable to sustain itself. And, and um, variations on this theme have become very common. Um, although now people think that our population may start shrinking soon. So this is a model. It's not a particularly accurate model. So um, the idea is that it gets us to conceptually understand how the math works. Uh, and then we can see how we can keep extending it, uh, the complexity of similar models and get closer to real phenomena. So if N is the um, a population, say a number of people in the population, this dot above the N means the time derivative. So it's a short way of writing dN over dt. So imagine that uh, it, the growth rate is proportional to uh, some fraction of the total population which is uh, equivalent to saying that some fraction of the total population is capable of having children, and the number of children they have is roughly constant on average. You can solve this exactly, and there you get the classic exponential um, curve. In fact, some of you have heard of Ray Kurzweil's idea of the, the singularity, and it's based basically on, on the same principle, which is, in his case, if n represents the state of technology, and it's always a function of existing technology, then technology can only increase exponentially. It's circumstantial evidence for this sort of thing, but there are plenty of fields where this is not true. Now, as, as I said before, clearly um, populations don't uh, expand exponentially. Eventually things taper off and we have very rarely does one see this Malthusian catastrophe. So one way to soft, to change the model is to say, well, because of resource depletion, the, the growth rate may be variable. So this R might not be a constant. Uh, you might say that, well, as the food resources start to uh, get more scarce, the uh, number of children that each generation has declines. And here, again, you can just plot this visually without even specifying the mathematics and to start to think about what might happen. But then if you want to... Uh, put a mathematical term there, you can start with the simplest thing you could imagine, which is just a linear decrease. And there you get a famous equation, the logistic equation, um, which um, has a, a lot more structure than just exponential growth. Um, you have an attractor and a repeller. So what does, a, what, what does this mean? This means that with a system like this, the entire population will tend towards a particular fixed point. It will reach a particular population and stay there. And why is it called an attractor? Because if you were to sort of externally add a, a few more people um, so that it goes here, then eventually because of the same dynamics, it would go back to that same population. The same is true if you were to sort of reduce the population by a little bit. There's a, a sudden um, infection, a, a pand pandemic, but eventually the system would reach there. This other point is at zero, it's called a repello, because in this particular system, uh, if you start at zero, exactly zero, there's no one to reproduce, so the population um, stays where it is. But as soon as you have even one breeding pair, for instance, uh, immediately the system moves towards the attractor. So repeller has the opposite property. Even a small change from that point, it, it, the system rushes away from the repeller. So already we see two of the key structures that show up in dynamical systems. Now the same um, basic dynamics co governed by this equation um, can be used to think about 
a neural population um, of, let's say, intrinsically firing neurons for now. They don't have any input. Uh, and they have some sort of maximum uh, activity and they excite each other. You can use something like this. And from there, modelers often add additional considerations about inputs and in inhibition. So even from this very, very simple model, you can start to approach what are known as rate models in neuroscience. But sticking with examples from outside neuroscience for now, we can talk about a famous case when there are two populations. Um, predator, like a fox, and prey, like a rabbit. Um, we have a, a system where one of them grows and is sort of eaten uh, by the other species. And uh, so X here is the rabbits and Y is the foxes. It's a very simple system, but there's no closed form solution. You actually have to simulate in order to see what will happen. Um, and it's called the lotka volterra model. It's been around for a while and it's a classic system to get a handle on um, how dynamical systems theory is used. Uh, again, it's a, it's a toy model, meaning that it's not going to exactly fit any predator prey system. But I believe that um, um, people in the field have seen oscillating phenomena that you can understand with the help of this, this, um, this model. So it's a toy model that has a lot of simplifying assumptions. The, um, the, the prey, population always has ample food. Uh, the food supply of the predators is entirely dependent on the single prey population. Um, rate of change of population is proportional to its size, just like in the Malthusian case. And um, during the process, there's, there's no uh, changes in favor of one species. Um, and the predators have limitless appetite. So as you can see, it's a very simplified um, model. And there are no uh, random fluctuations um, and no generations arise at each moment. This can be tweaked when you simulate it. Um, and you know there are some things that are very unrealistic, such as fractional rabbits and foxes. Um, but what you see, as I, as, I, as I mentioned, is oscillatory phenomena. You see that the populations cycle. Uh, so you have a kind of qualitatively very interesting phenomenon. Um, and there are other things you can learn. So what if the number of foxes suddenly drops that you can do in a simulation by explicitly dragging it down? What would you expect to happen? Um, interestingly, decreasing the number of foxes creates a sort of larger oscillation. Both the rabbits and foxes seem to reach a higher peak. Um, this initially seems maybe not, not so intuitive, but we can look at this from dynamical systems theory and gain some perspective. So we can plot, um, instead of time on the x-axis, we can plot the population of foxes and the population of rabbits. Um, this closed loop um, that we'll see here uh, shows the oscillatory dynamics. So initially we have this blue curve, which is the oscillation. So time now is not is implied here. Um, and we can see that with this sudden decrease in the foxes, you get to this larger loop. And we'll see in a moment why this is um, the case, but this is a kind of inkling of how this geometric perspective works. That even though you're decreasing something, you're entering a kind of larger loop uh, that's imply it, that's sort of latent in the system. Um, so this brings us to, uh, so we can dive into what we mean by the dimensions of a system and what this plot really is. Um, as I said before, uh, we have abstract state spaces and um, number of dimensions um, uh, is the foxes and the number of foxes and rabbits is the dimensions of this state space. Um, a dimension could be a spatial coordinate or it could be a measurable quantity, any measurable quantity. Uh, some people use the term degree of, free of freedom in uh, machine learning and, art and AI sometimes um, feature space is used for some of these things. Um, and it's basically a representation of the possibilities of the system. All of them are captured in this space. Uh, once you specify this, that's basically everything that can happen in the system. And for 1D, 2D, and 3D systems, we can visualize the state space exactly. Once you go to higher dimensions, you have to leave out a few dimensions in order to visualize anything. So, more than three dimensions, 
not possible to visualize, but we can still use tools to get our get a handle on. Um, so one way to think about the state space is with a kind of geographical uh, analogy, like my peaks and valleys is one way to think about it. The attractor um, is a set of points that the system will tend to approach. Um, and that's true in any dimension. So it's like a valley. You have a ball at the top of a valley, the ball will tend to reach the bottom of the valley. Um, and so if you move it from the bottom of the valley, it will eventually go back to the valley. Um, at the repeller is like a peak, where if you place it on the peak, it could stay there if it's exactly at the peak, but any small movement, a gust of wind will call it, cause it to rush away from that. Uh, and then you have a concept called saddle nodes, which are actually quite interesting, maybe a little technical, but you'll come across them in more detailed treatments. And they're, and they're potentially quite important for um, quasi-stable systems like brains. Um, they're like passages between two peaks or two ridges. They're poised between locations of stability. So um, in addition to just looking at the dimensions, um, we can also uh, represent how the changes take place. This is called a phase plane. We plot the derivatives at each point as arrows. See these black arrows here. So the direction of each arrow, you can see, is specifying the direction of change. So if you happen to start the sim a simulation with over here, with like three and three for the foxes and rabbits, that's the direction in which the change will go. And the the length of each arrow will tell you how fast it will move. So you get a sort of global snapshot of change in the system. You can see that down here, the changes are quite slow, and much faster up in this region. Um, and if you look at it more closely, you'll see that all these loops, um, there's no kind of, um, they're not like a vortex. So that, and that's one of the reasons that if you bump the system, it will just occupy a new circle. Uh, they're sort of like concentric circles. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you are looking at dynamical systems is to keep track of what's on the X and Y axis. If it's time on the X axis, it's a, we're showing the solution basically. And you might bump a system like we increase or decrease the number of foxes and that's a perturbation. Uh, sometimes you can, for one dimension, you can plot the derivative versus um, X, which is just the single dimension, and you can see the attractors. Uh, you may plot just dimensions and time is implied, or if you have to see uh, uh, the evolution in time with a video. So that's, there's plenty of different graphs to keep in mind. So um, dynamical systems theory has been well used at the single neuron level. So it's, uh, for motivation purposes, good to catch a glimpse of this. Um, this uh, is the Hodgkin-Huxley network. And don't worry, I'm not expecting anyone to uh, know exactly what this is or how to solve it. But this is one of the, arguably one of the most successful mathematical models in biology. Um, and it produces spikes that are exceptionally accurate. Um, um, it was initially used for the squid giant axon, but now it's routinely used for um, various neurons. It, it, the same framework can be used to fit different neuron types and active dendrites. Um, so you could say that the depolarization and hyperpolarization are sort of the, the rabbits and foxes uh, of a neuron. So there's some analogy we can make with what we just saw. Um, the similarity here um, can be revealed by plotting two of the four variables. So as I said, we've already reached a four dimensional model. Uh, so this is not a complete picture, just keep that in mind. But we see this loop when we plot um, the, the voltage versus uh, one of the uh, gating variables, the potassium gating variable, which contributes to the recovery of a neuron. Um, so this spiking when you plot versus time becomes a loop when you plot, plot it um, in a state space, basically. So um, another key concept uh, is a limit cycle. Uh, so in 1D, we saw an attractor and repeller, there's another kind of stable structure you can have in 2D called a limit cycle. Um, and here's a big difference with the predator-prey system, the Lotka-Voltaire system. Here, the oscillations are, are stable. 
for a given input. What might that mean? If you were to look at the, the phase plane where we, where we see the, all the derivatives, the snapshot, you see that uh, if you're within the, the limit cycle, the system is pushed towards it to move in the cycle. If you're outside it, also the system is pushed towards it. So it's like a vortex. The system will find its way back to oscillatory behavior. And that's quite different from um, the predator play system, which has just concentric circles. Um, you can see this um, in uh, a simulation of the Hodgkin-Huxley system. In this case, I have steady input, which causes steady firing. I have a perturbation, in this case, a fairly large perturbation, but it, it eventually just returns back to the same cycle. Um, yes, so the the paradoxical perturbation I, I showed with the, with, the, um, with the fox, where see, a strange thing happened, you can kind of see something like this uh, in some uh, neural models. So here we have steady firing at a partic particular input level. And look what I've done here. I've introduced a very small increase in the excitatory input. And this has silenced the neuron. It's a little bit uh, counterintuitive. How could excitation cause uh, a cell to stop firing? As it turns out, um, this was a prediction um, from dynamical systems theory. Um, John Renzel and some colleagues were analyzing how these fixed points, attractors and repellers and limit cycles, change with changes in parameters, such as the input. Um, so they look and they show that some types of neurons uh, uh, could be silenced by a transient input. So some of you will be aware that there are a couple of different, uh, this is a very coarse uh, kind of categorization, but some neurons sort of respond smoothly to increases in input. So that for whatever input, you have some firing rate. There are other neurons, typically inhibitory neurons, uh, that will not fire at all for low values of input and then suddenly jump to a fairly high firing rate. It's these class two neurons that you can silence by providing a transient input. You're basically bumping it out of its limit cycle into a, an attractor, which is the resting silent cell. That brings us to the concept of bifurcations. So as we've seen, the qualitative behavior of a system can change. When we say qualitative, we mean things other than just increase and decrease. So um, oscillatory behavior is qualitatively different from uh, constant uh, voltage, um, and that's a qualitative change. And something, in this case, the input current is responsible for this qualitative change. That's called a bifurcation. And in the Ishikevich book, you see that um, there's a fancy term for it, the supercritical andronov hopf bifurcation. Uh, all it means is that as you increase uh, the current, um, the system is at rest, and then all of a sudden becomes uh, a steadily firing neuron. And there are many different um, phenomena like this that you can study where something changes uh, as a result of a single parameter being increased. So we can then kind of summarize and say, well, what's the recipe book? What's the di dynamical systems theory approach? We find differential equations that capture how the variables change over time. They could be purely derived from the data or for, for some principles, some laws of physics or chemistry. Um, and then we study the qualitative features of the system. And by system here, I mean system of equations um, that you, um, not the data per se or the phenomenon. Those are, as we've seen, attractors, repellers, limit cycles that we talked about. Uh, there are other phenomena which you can um, dive into, are very interesting. There's strange attractors, which are a hallmark of chaotic systems, which are deterministic systems that trace out complicated paths that never repeat. In continuous systems, they're only possible in three dimensions and higher. Um, bifurcations, which we just saw. Again, I've said this, and in one, one and 2D systems, you can visualize this exactly. In 3D, it's a little difficult on a screen, but you can kind of show it, but it's not ideal. Um, in more complex systems, all these visualizations are partial and approximate. 
But interestingly, in some cases, you can use some of the, the dynamical systems methods uh, without even specifying the differential equations. Mathematicians have pursued this in very interesting ways, that, and uh, there's a whole uh, field of that. Uh, and the last thing to do is use the insights from uh, these, these sort of toy systems to understand the real system and predict data that haven't been collected yet, such as the paradoxical effect of a little perturbation. This is the hardest step um, in particularly in complex systems as you go to networks and, and behavior. So with that, let's talk about behavior. And here we've kind of left the, the zone where we're talking about these terms precisely using the textbook notions. We're going to use, be a little bit more metaphorical here, but potentially there are ways of making this more precise. Um, let's imagine various behavioral states are attractor-like. And an example I mentioned briefly in that review paper is hunger, and there could be any drive. So for instance, when you're hungry, um, you may suddenly be distracted. Like if, a, if, if there's a fire in the building, you're not going to first eat and then run. So that's a kind of perturbation of, of the hunger state, but eventually you'll realize, oh yes, I'm hungry. Um, and so certain things, even if they're deep, you deviate from them, you need to return to them. Um, so, Hunger being uh, uh, an example. Any kind of long-term goal has this quality. Um, there are negative things also that have this quality. Repetitive thoughts, for instance, that we would rather not have, or like source of, sources of anxiety. You, you might have a, a fun day and then forget your troubles, but then the troubles come back to you in the evening. Uh, those are not so good attractors. In fact, I, I once attended a talk by a neuroscientist who was a, um, into Buddhist meditation and she explicitly used this uh, attractor met metaphor to talk about repetitive thoughts. And uh, she had some speculative ideas for how meditation can help uh, reduce the, the, the intensity of the attractor. Um, as I said, distractions can be viewed as perturbation, temporarily pulling you away from a particular state. Um, the space of possible um, stable behaviors can be understood in terms of a landscape of attractor. So there are many possible things you could be doing, each of which, when you enter um, that attractor state of basin, is relatively stable. It's not globally stable, meaning that there's a there's a large enough perturbation that can get you out of one zone and into another. And uh, this is a common feature of systems that have many dimensions. Um, so this is the point I, I made in the review paper that um, the attractor basin of any given goal-oriented state must not be too deep. Uh, the basin is the, the sort of shape around the attractor itself, which is a point or a group of points. Um, if an animal becomes so unwavering in its search for food that it is not perturbed by the appearance of a predator, then it is unlikely to survive for very long. So behavioral flexibility requires that certain stimuli can nudge the system from one attractor basin to another. There to there. In other words, the trajectories of a flexible neural system are likely to traverse regions of state space that are repellers, like up here, since such regions are poised to enter nearby attractor basins. So being able to kind of climb out of an attractor state and sort of live on the edge of a valley can be quite useful because that means you can do multiple things. So some of this uh, has a uh, we can think about in one of the modeling papers that I was involved in, although unfortunately I didn't use the term dynamical systems terminology in this paper. So um, schizophrenia is a very complicated disorder and there are many, many um, um, symptoms. The most famous symptoms are visual hallucinations, uh, sorry, auditory hallucinations, hearing voices and things like that. Um, so we didn't target that. We found another uh, um, symptom, which is actually quite diagnostic. Uh, in this, uh, this has been known for some time that um, schizophrenia patients have erratic eye movements. So in this study, for instance, they looked at um, smooth pursuit, where you have sinusoids or lysergous figures, you have a dot moving on a screen, and you have to just follow along with it. Um, and healthy controls have no real problem. They can follow the, the dot on the screen fairly easily. But as you can see with the patients, the, their movements are quite erratic. Sometimes they lose track and then they have to catch up with where the, where the dot on the screen is. 
Um, they also have problems with fixation. Well, if you provide a point and you say, just look at the point and don't look at this distractor. Again, the healthy controls seem to have no problem holding their attention on a point. Uh, but with the, the schizophrenia patients, they keep looking at the distractor. So these two phenomena we thought were tractable from a computational perspective. Uh, so we sought um, to model that. Um, we, we used uh, a corticothalamic uh, visual attention circuit. Um, we can go into the details of how this was constructed in the question and answer session. Um, but the basic idea is that um, eye movements involve many regions, but these cortical reticulothalamic uh, regions, that's cortex, thalamic reticular nucleus, and thalamus, are central to attention and targeting and selection for a variety of, um, of similar phenomena, not just eye movements. And um, we, it, it's been reported in the literature uh, with post-mortem studies, for instance, that um, inhibition may be disrupted in schizophrenia. So we thought, well, let's look at this circuit that's involved in eye movements and see what happens when we perturb, when we disrupt the um, inhibition, or in, in, as we'll see, some of it is more like a bifurcation. Um, now, how this works is um, we have something called an error map, where in, our, in my case, we have a sort of one dimensional version of this visual system where a dot could be moving on the left side or the right side. And the control to maintain a dot at the center, say for the smooth pursuit, is that if there's a dot, a bright dot on the right side of this cortical pattern, then the system moves right. Um, if it's on the left, the system moves left. This is a basic cybernetic mechanism. This has been around since the 40s, I believe. And it's a way of using small errors to actually maintain something with, on average, zero error. You have to calibrate it. And that's basically how the system controls a virtual eye. Um, and how the attention works is by lateral inhibition. So you have corticothalamic loops that are in parallel. We have groups of cortex, TRN, and thalamus that are roughly functionally integrated. And with the TRN, you have one loop can inhibit an adjacent loop. And the idea here is that if you want to hold your attention to some point in the middle, uh, you, you have more activation here. And that could be because of bottom-up input or because of a top-down bias. And that way you can block out um, what's on the sides, uh, the, the other uh, loops. So what we did was uh, we, we got the system calibrated so that it could perform smooth pursuit. And then we disrupted it. We, we changed the, we reduced several of the sources of inhibition one by one. So in this case, we were looking at fast spiking into neurons in the cortex. So you see initially uh, it's, it's uh, smoothly pursuing the target in blue, the eye position in red. And here I, we, we manipulated the inhibitory neurons. So there's weaker inhibition and you see this erratic movement. Um, and similarly for the for the fixation task, the task is to hold up, hold a particular target in blue. And then the, there's a distractor there. It was able to avoid the distractor, but then once the disruption happened, it keeps jumping to the to the distractor and back again, just like in the case with the patients. And we did this for a couple of different um, sources of inhibition and also the thalamic reticular nucleus. So weakening inhibitory control disrupted visual attention in a way that may uh, explain um, how the symptoms arise in the patients. And this didn't make it into the paper, but we could think about this as in terms of bifurcations. We've gone from what is not a particularly oscillatory system to, or one that, to one that has less stability and more distractibility. So a qualitative change has occurred as a result of changing this single dimension, which is the amount of inhibition. Um, and this in turn, I think it is useful to, to view in terms of uh, changes to an attentional attractor basin. So uh, if you're trying to pay attention to a region of the visual field, you can think of that as a basin that uh, you can get distracted a little bit, but you'll always come back. In fact, yeah. So uh, this was something that, that came up that was in an early version of the draft. We had to remove it for uh, reasons of brevity. Um, but uh, one way that I that 
this this way of thinking influenced the model was in terms of how I incorporated um, top-down regulation of inhibition in TLA. So there's this experimental paper in mice uh, from Valley Connors groups, Crandall, Tukchank, and Connors paper, where they stimulated in cortex and were able to regulate the inhibition in thalamus. So what they found is that high or persistent activity in, in cortex, going from 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz, uh, was able to reduce uh, the inhibition from TRN to thalamus. You can see that here, um, that basically the GABA was reduced as a result of persistent elevated activity in cortex. So this is quite an interesting uh, phenomenon that I incorporated into the model. So what they found is that there was short-term synaptic depression of inhibitory synapses. So I use this in a way to regulate these attentional attractive basins. So if you see elevated activity in the cortex, you tamp down on inhibition, but in a targeted way. So it's as if um, this, this, the loop that is receiving a little bit more persistent activity is sort of freeing up the corresponding part of the thalamus so that that particular loop can stay active and more strongly inhibit the competitors. So if you get some stable firing in the deep layers of cortex, you can deepen the basin, meaning that it's easier that for this particular um, um, state to be maintained and for the neighboring adjacent states to be um, suppressed. So we described this um, uh, in an early draft uh, in this way. So the model uh, circuit functions as a continuous attractor system. So each position that you that the eye could focus on is an attractor and it has a basin. So there's a way in which it can be stably focused on that point. And with this persistent activity, you create islands of reduced inhibition. So there's certain parts of the thalamus that have been spared inhibition. And these can be viewed as uh, cortical modulation of the depth of an attractor basin. Um, the attractor basins can bias thalamocortical signaling so that it's strong whenever it aligns with cortical thalamic expectation. So if you have some top-down expectation, then you can deepen a particular attractor. So it's like saying, if, I, if you're expecting or want something in a particular space, then you can make it easier for that system to stabilize around that point. So this short-term depression mechanism is triggered by this persistent activity, as I mentioned here in the deep layers that goes down here. Now, so we can think about this in terms of a more broad concept of competitive networks. In com like I said in the previous uh, slide, there was these competition between pairs of or sets of cortical thalamic loops. When you increase self-excitation, um, which is groups that are in exciting each other, that's another way you can deepen an attractor basin and make the system less sensitive to di um, distractors. Uh, and as we showed, we can inhibition can also achieve some of this. Um, and now we can speculate, but this is something we can actually model without too much difficulty, that a behavioral attractor state that is too deep may correspond to excessive attentional fixation. So for instance, if you're obsessed with something or you have a compulsion or a phobia or some anxiety, um, you may constantly maintain the stability of that so that someone tries to cheer you up or take, distract you with something else, eventually you go back to that same state. Similarly, repetitive actions and habits or thoughts, they, can, they are temporarily uh, distracted. Um, you can take the system away from that point, but then the system returns to churning out that activity. Um, now, on the other hand, if you have a attractor basin that's too shallow, that could correspond to an attention deficit, such as elevated distractibility. So if, if you're unable to maintain this strong um, uh, state, then a small distraction could completely distract, uh, move you to do something unrelated to your goal. So regulation of attractor basins uh, is, I think, uh, a major aspect of behavioral flexibility. And I, I think the literature supports this, even if we don't see 
the dynamical systems theory framing. But I think that the stability framing um, uh, might, if, if it's more widely adopted, you might actually be able to pick out things in the data that maybe some people haven't noticed. Um, and just as a last point, I thought uh, it would be interesting to link this with uh, neuromodulation. And um, some of the work of, of James uh, McShane uh, is related to this. So for instance, I came across a, a paper on acetylcholine and serotonin regulating uh, the firing in deep layers of cortex, I think specifically layer six. So you have this two ways of regulating firing in this um, deep uh, cortical region, which I, uh, I showed was regulating an attractor base in size. So that means that we potentially with these sort of well-known neuromodulatory systems, you can get a kind of bidirectional control um, of the uh, tractor basins. So if ACH elevates firing, you could um, boost this ability to disinhibit and maintain a particular loop. ACH acetylcholine is well known to be involved in attentional modulation and boosting performance in some cases. Um, serotonin is a much more complicated neurotransmitter. Um, uh, as many things it's related to depression potentially and to the functioning of psychedelic uh, um, chemicals. And here it's, in, it's doing the opposite. So what could that help with? If you have, if you can weaken attractor basins, that may be useful for exploration. You don't want to get stuck in any one idea or action or course of behavior when you're, when you're exploring. You want to try different things. So you don't want to get stuck in any one place. So this balance between a, a more cholinergically dominated state and a more serotonergic state may relate to a balance between um, the, what they call explore and exploit. There's very interesting literature in psychology and in, in neuroscience about the explore exploit trade off. So, once again, the point here is that regulating attractor basins is a kind of a, another angle on uh, modifying a system, causing a bifurcation potentially. That, um, that we can interpret in terms of these high level behaviors, explore and exploit, and um, not too difficult to model these kinds of things. So uh, I know this is a lot that has been in this, uh, but it's a kind of a tour, a very high level tour, but um, let's wrap up. So um, dynamical systems theory has mathematical tools and conceptual frameworks for studying time varying phenomena. Um, these geometric and visual uh, concepts um, are quite useful even when we can't um, visualize the system. So some of the math tools uh, still are applicable for much higher dimensions. Um, as I've said, stability and flexibility in the face of per perturbations are useful concepts, not just for neural dynamics, but also high level behavior, cognition, emotion, all of them. And um, attractive basin depth may be a unifying framework within which to link these low-level neural phenomena, excitation, inhibition, modulation, with high-level high phenomena such as attention and exploration. Um, and as I mentioned within the case of schizophrenia, some symptoms of psychiatric disorders may be understood as abnormal bifurcations that could change stability, introduce oscillatory behavior, things like that. And with that, I'll conclude, thank my colleagues and uh, my funding agencies and happy to take questions. Uh, hope it wasn't too long. I tried, thought it would be 45. I think I went a little over. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Thank you, uh, Johan. So I will first stop simply the recording. Oops.